All right, this is Jimmy Jive, and you're listening to Motor City Rock Talk. Today, my guest is legendary songwriter, guitarist, multi-instrumentalist, Nolan Void, or a.k.a. Don Johns, as his friends know him, or his enemies, whichever way you want to put it. <laughs> Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> Hey, Don, it's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, likewise. I played this song purposely because it was the first song on the album, if that makes any sense. But it's your theme song, so to speak, so I, yeah, that was part of the reason. What do you think? you think it's, is it still your theme song, Don? Yeah, pretty much. You know, um, I, I, I think when I was writing the lyrics, I was thinking about The Clash, how this is Radio Clash and a few other songs where they were self-referential and, you know, kind of uh, inventing a myth about them. And so, <laughs> so I figure, uh, Why not, I right? figure I'll do the same, you know, why not? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, you know, if it works for them, maybe it'll work for me. Well, you, you did a couple like that, Don. You did, you did, the other one that comes to mind, of course, is World's Greatest Lover. And I know that was very tongue in cheek, but uh, I've heard that about you. So, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> Elaborate on that a little bit. Well, not to brag. But you will anyway. But, but, you know, when it comes to sex, sex for me is a lot like an Olympic event, once every four years. <laughs> and in 1980, I was boycotted. <laughs> So, so you can pretty much tell from that that uh, World's Greatest Lover was tongue-in-cheek. It was uh, like when I introduced that song, uh, playing it live, I said it's science fiction, more or less. <laughs> science fiction. <laughs> and and I was, it was kind of a parody of, you know, not a particular song or genre, but of the type of person, you know, like the Joe Studley who, uh, you know, thinks he's God's gift of uh, oh, women. Man. And I oh, kind oh, of yeah. wanted Metal guys. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I think you had a lot of anger towards that scene at one time. Well, not really anger, just kind of like Annoyance. disgust. <laughs> was that because you couldn't grow your hair that long? Which pretty, you could. Yeah, pretty, you, pretty much. And you weren't yeah. a pretty boy. All right, and, now let's and get, being and being follically challenged. <laughs> All right, let's get right down to it. You're are you, you're originally from Michigan, the Detroit area, aren't you? Yes, uh, I was born in uh, Dearborn at Oakwood Hospital, and my parents lived in uh, Northern Allen Park, so I was kind of a downriver rat to start out with. How did you? Uh, what attracted you to music, or a guitar, or both? Well, you know, just being a fan, and then I, I think what made me want to become a musician was uh, hearing a lot of great music growing up, and then when I saw the movie. Uh, the Blues Brothers in uh, 1980, that uh, final scene in the jail where the whole band is just, you know, I think they're playing Jailhouse Rock. Right, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's just like, that looks so cool. Yeah, I mean, it was. I was just like, you know, I, I want to I wanna do that. And it wasn't uh, long after that that I got my first guitar. So what I kind of started late. <laughs> what, what was your first guitar? It was a global acoustic. It was probably like a 60 or $70 instrument. That now, my, where did uh, you get that? Me. My my parents got that for me for I think a, uh, I think it was too early for a birthday or Christmas present, but they just said, well maybe if we get him a guitar, he'll shut up. <laughs> And it kind of worked. It was sort of like uh, uh, what Frank Zappa said was, shut up and play your guitar. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. it took a while to be able to play and sing at the same time. And uh, I was glad I was able to do that because uh, not everybody can do that. That's right. And uh, some people will say, yeah, including you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, they, you know, they everybody's know got better. an opinion. Yeah, so. and nobody would know any better to say <laughs> something like that. What, uh, you kind of mentioned uh, a little bit, but what were some of your earliest influences that, to get you into guitar or oh, into music specifically? So many. Um, going back to the 50s, I would say Chuck Berry, uh, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Bo Diddley, Buddy Holly, uh, Everly Brothers, you know, people like that. And then, you know, the Beatles, Stones, uh, uh, Hollies, Searchers, you know, the uh, Kinks, Who. So you had you had quite a rounded off interest in music both styles. Yeah, I see. Any yeah, jazz I influences? 
I didn't get into jazz until later, and uh, I, I think I think my first jazz album I bought was probably about 1984, 1985, and then now I probably have like about 600 jazz albums in Who's my collection. Who's your favorite jazz artists? Because I would say your music doesn't lend itself to that, but you're an intelligent man. At least I've heard you are. He's making that facial expression. <laughs> Who are some of your favorite jazz artists? Though? Well, I would I would say um, saxophone, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, guitar, Kenny Burrell, who's a Detroiter, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, keyboards, uh, uh, I would say Mose Allison, who's also you know, one of my favorite uh, jazz vocalists as well. Very bluesy. And then Horace Silver on a piano. Great, uh, great composer as well as a uh, player and band leader. Uh, bass, Ron Carter, uh, Paul Chambers, uh, you're drums, name, you're Elvin. you name drop everybody here. Elvin Jones, <laughs> <laughs> Billy Higgins, you know. Well, what about the monkeys? Roy Have Higgins. you ever heard of the monkeys? Yeah, they're great, you know. They, I, I can never understand why there was so much animosity to them as a prefab band. The Birds, which is a band that I love, right. that's another big influence. Um, they were a, as much of a prefabricated band as the Monkees were, but for some reason they were accepted, but the Monkees weren't. But you and go they, back. And they had some great writers. I mean, you know, uh, Oh yeah. I just saw Mickey Dolenz a couple of weeks ago and stuff, and he, he talked about that same thing you were talking about, and he said, well, we had some of the greatest music writers, you know, Neil Diamond, Neil Sadaka. Voice uh, and Heart. Voice and Heart. And uh, Goffin and King. Yeah. I mean, those yeah. are top drawer, top yeah. notch. I and mean, even you can't the get writers. Better. And even the writers for the show, for writing the, the, the stick, the, the comic spots, were right on brilliant. And of course, they did write music. Mike Nesmith, of course, did. And, and it was some really good stuff. Yeah, I'm a big fan it. of uh, Mike Nesmith's solo stuff after he left the Monkees, right, the right. first uh, first national band and the second national band. He was uh, definitely a pioneer of country rock. Right. Um, he, you know, there was like about four or country five albums. Country folk country rock. Well, country rock, and he had a terrific uh, pedal steel player. Uh, uh, was it uh, Red Roads? And he he was a, just a terrific uh, instrumentalist. In fact, they did an album called "And the Hits Keep On Coming, Keep Right On Coming," and it was just uh, Nesmith's vocals, guitar, and the steel guitar. No drums or bass. On a couple tracks, there they had a full ensemble, but just you know, just really good stuff and. Hardly anybody heard it, but uh, yeah, there's there's so much music that I that I uh, listen to that is uh, either directly or indirectly influenced me. I have over six thousand titles in my music collection. It's CDs everything from I got, right? CDs, CDs, vinyl. Oh, I've got a right. uh, couple of mini discs, cassette. I've got. Every format. Every genre, every format. Yeah. All right, let's, let, let's talk a little, let's, we mentioned your influences and all that. Now let's talk a little bit about your career as a musician. Do you uh, recall, for example, your first gig and how did it go? Yeah, my first gig in front of an audience, I believe, was Christmas, right around Christmas time, 1985. Uh, my buddies, the Noise Boys, uh, said, yeah, you can open up for us. So I uh, went up there just my just myself. My nerves, <laughs> my 74 Fender Telecaster, and my 1958 4 watt Rickenbacker, or no, Magnetone tube amp that uh, <laughs> wasn't ex exactly up for the task, but it was all I had. Do you remember some of the songs you performed then? I mean, I oh, know we're geez. older. I mean, are they. You know, I don't think I'm not sure how many of those songs I even even you know played after that. You know, it's like I I really can't recall. I don't know. Do you, I think you were there. Do you remember? <laughs> well, uh, was that the gig where you had the one you had the drummer, the big guy in a small set? Wow. No, I'm. Or was that the, or was that the show at the Cowboy? Oh, it's all a blur. You know. <laughs> oh. I know that. <laughs> I think that might have been that might have been another one because I think I opened up for the Noise Boys a couple of different times, but yeah, you know no, I that, that might have been yeah that might have been with uh, Vegas Rads on uh, drums, and I think we were able to get together for like one maybe one hour practice session, and uh, at the time Raz didn't have a drum kit, and I had a little beginner kids kit <laughs> that, that one of my uncles found at a garage sale for right. ten bucks. <laughs> 
picked it up and said, hey, I think you'll, I think you can use this. <laughs> you can just, use this. <laughs> and, if you don't play the drums, you just, can store Just let me know when you play so I can be nowhere near. <laughs> <laughs> but and what, was that at reruns or where was that? Yeah, at? that was at reruns. That's where I probably played the most. I I think I had one gig at Paychecks, one at Lily's, a couple couple or three at the uh, Hamtramck Pub. But those were like the the four core venues. Right, uh, they really were. You know, for like if you're doing original rock music. You know, so those you were, were the four that you would play. There was a few other clubs, but so you never, you, you were never ever at hard clubs. No, no, they, <laughs> they, they, they would be. You know, uh, they, they might let me in if I paid. <laughs> pay to play. Well, that's usually how you got into those places. Yeah. And so anyway, so that was more or less your first gig, and I, and I do remember seeing you with the Noise Boys, and and later down the line, you actually uh, got Mikey Mo to play with you. And all that was that way down the line or was he doing it on the side with you when they weren't playing or well that was down the line uh he he joined the uh i would say it was about 1986 when he joined the noise boys because the original guitarist and singer pat sarniak uh, 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 took off uh, after i don't know a gig or two because he said that mikey Mo played too loud ah, and I he probably he probably had a point because he had a 100 watt Marshall combo that he usually dined, and that's what he was playing through at that time. So he, you know, you, you could hear him a you know, mile or two away, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, but he was good. Oh, Mikey yeah, really good. good. Really in, good. In fact, uh, you know, my, uh, if I could have had the band that I, that I had there for a little, I, I had two different bands and they never quite gelled in that time period, but if I could have had like you and John Skippy Meadows and bass and drums and uh, Mikey Mo on lead guitar and me on rhythm and uh, lead vocals. I think we could have uh, kicked up some dust. Oh, we definitely would have. Yeah. But uh, but you I know thought we, we did play together at least at yeah at we the Ford Play Mansion once or twice. Yeah, or I I don't know if we ever played out for a gig. But no, I don't I'm pretty think sure. So. I know we played at a party when we had Chuck. Uh, Powell on drums because I think uh, Skippy was doing something else by then. That was probably about 91 or 92, something like that. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I. Who are was, some of the Who are some of the other uh, groups locally or national? Well, we'll get to the national thing. Who are some of the other local groups that you would have opened up for that you remember? Well, the uh, you know the, the biggest one was uh, uh, the Cowboy Junkies. Right. I opened up for them uh, April of 19. 87 and I had a three-piece band then with uh, Bob Branham on drums and uh, uh, Eric Lockhart on bass and myself and we uh, we opened up up for them probably did like a 30-minute set I think there was yeah, probably I remember I was there probably was like show. like 30 people who showed up there first time the Cowboy Junkies played me. in the US yes and Brian and that, got them over, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, Brian T. Kirchner uh, was doing promotion uh, work uh, with a lot of uh, Canadian bands. You know, uh, Forgotten Rebels, right. uh, Dave Rave, uh, Cowboy Junkies. Were they from Toronto, Toronto, do you remember? Or, or? The Cowboy Junkies, I believe, were from uh, Toronto. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and you know, Brian so, wrote, uh, didn't Brian write for a couple of magazines or something at that time? Yeah, I think uh, Jam Rag, which yeah. I think Tom Ness uh, yeah, published. Yeah, Tom Ness. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so we, we did that, and I remember I had to pick up Bob, the drummer, before that show, and my, my car was having uh, radiator problems, so <laughs> we, we, we kind of limped in to what the... What car uh, was yeah, that, Do you remember I, I think that? I had a uh, 1974 Ford Torino. Torino. I think I remember that car. It was, a, it was definitely a beater. <laughs> and yeah, it, was, it had a lot of quirks to it, so I, I was well, lucky so I was able so to, to get to car. the gig. <laughs> now, do you remember? I mean, that that had to be a big night for you, a big boost for you, playing for or playing even for a smaller audience or whatever with the Cowboy Junkies. Do you remember any of the songs from that set? <laughs> Name yeah. one, Donnie. You oh, yeah. have to make it up. Probably <laughs> Surfing to Jamaica and I'm the Void. I think that was probably by that time was uh, part of the set and 
Oh, beyond that, you know, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to put my thinking cap on. And get but, the Wayback Machine. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, that was about a year, about a year, year and a half before they really were on the map. They had one album out at that time, which I believe came out in 1986, called uh, "Whites Off Earth Now." And then their second album, uh, the Trinity Sessions, oh, yeah, was the one that had Sweet Jane. Yes. And, uh, Blue Moon and a whole bunch of other, you know, uh, uh, songs on there. And they, you know, they were like, uh, you know, were definitely written about and you know, really didn't they shot have, up. Didn't they have a female lead vocalist or, or something? Yes, Margot yeah. Timmons. Yeah. I think uh, she had one or two brothers uh, in the band as well. Did you get? Did you after the show or anything talk to them at all? Mm, no, no, no. They. They, they probably were wishing that we were the inaudible postman instead of the <laughs> invisible postman, which is the oh, so thing knew, we were going by. You were the invisible postman at that time. Yep. And because I, I know you've had several name changes over the years. I, I remember playing with you with the, as the invisible postman, but you were going, I don't know, maybe it was just a minute as the dead billionaires, or was it millionaires? Oh, probably. Either or, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably for maybe a couple of days. Because I think because I had I think I had a song I was working on called Dead Millionaire, but uh, <laughs> but and I thought, ah, oh, what, what the heck, you know? And, now, uh, <laughs> when what would have been your first recording, whether it was in the basement, over at the Fort Play Mansion, when you were living there with John and I, and then of course later with Brian. I don't remember. Did you do any recording down there on, on Donnie on Jenna's Sport Track? I know we recorded that so. basement session with Skippy. I don't but. think uh, on I don't think on John's. Maybe maybe once or twice, but I I can't I can't recall. But I know I eventually got a TX 3340 open reel four track, and I think I recorded a song or two with uh, remember uh, Mark Simich? Yes, yes. He was also he was a, a resident at the uh, at mental asylum. Resident. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Grand <laughs> Granville Estate. And, but I, I think I had a song called New Year's Day. Which had nothing to do with the uh, U2 the song of that name. That's that's a song I might resurrect. Was that about a hangover? Life. Well, <laughs> pr that was, it was probably it wasn't about it, but it was probably inspired by by one. <laughs> well, that's the, that was the other thing I was going to talk to you about. I that. was hitting I was hitting the, the beer a little bit we more than were. I should have. <laughs> we all were down. We were all that. young. We were partying. Just uh, like yeah. All I remember was. Uh, we couldn't afford anything much better than red, white, and blue, which was the bottom of the barrel. Oh, jeez. You get a six pack for two bucks or three bucks. <laughs> We'd throw parties just to get just to get the returnables. Yeah. Um, and I remember uh, when you did the jump and jive, you uh, had a thank you in the liner notes to red, white, and blue beer. They could ask for an amen. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you talk about getting this TAC. Do you remember what you, what you, what your first recording might have been or recordings? Well, I think going back, going back to like 1984, I bought that TX from my brother-in-law, and I remember uh, I was in '84. I was uh, renting a room from my sister and brother-in-law in Allen Park, and he had that four track, and we recorded a song called "Owl Stretching Time," which a version of it is on this album that's oh, playing really? in the background. That, that goes back that far, eh? Yeah, and uh, wow. my my uh, college uh, friend uh, John Harrison, uh, J Dub, uh, pretty good bass player. So we we did a did the original version of uh, "Owl Stretching Time," and I played drums. I didn't have a, I didn't have that even that little kid kit. I had a rolled up newspaper for the snare, and I don't even think we had a, you know, no symbol. Just a rope like that. I mean, what do you mean? Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, was it wrapped up in your well, fist? What I, well, what I did, I, I kind of folded it and tucked it together and taped it with duct tape. And I had, I actually had some drumsticks, and I just had a mic on it and then added some reverb, and that was the snare. And that's basically all we had. I might have had my my uh, my foot tapping the bass drum rhythm, but right. that's all we had. And then he played the, like a three note bass line and I had like a one chord uh, guitar figure that I played on acoustic. And I, I don't think I had the, oh, I did have an electric, but I, I figured acoustic was uh, more fitting for some reason. Yeah, because the newspaper. So uh, <laughs> J-Dub 
did the vocals, trying to do like a uh, uh, pale imitation of James Brown, and he had a kazoo. And he, he uh, after he, he would sing, he would do like uh, JB's horn <laughs> horn parts <laughs> on the kazoo. And make Frank Zappa proud. And we uh, we didn't have a click track, so my 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 tempo was a little bit tempo rubato, kind of <laughs> sped up and slowed down. I'm just like, well, that makes it exciting and different. Yeah. And, and now what song was that whole... exactly? Was that Owl Stretching Time? Owl Stretching Time. And wh- what's the story behind that, Don? What are you what are you talking about? Well, I think uh, more Don. It was others. it was J Dub. I think it came up with the idea. Owl Stretching Time was the original name of the Monty Python comedy troupe. Oh. And one of their early, one of their earliest uh, episodes from I think 1969 was still called Owl Stretching Time. Oh, that's and then he good. thought, well, you know, like let's do like a parody of James Brown doing a dance number called Owl Stretching Time. <laughs> And, but and, I mean, he, lyrically. And, and he came up with like some some uh, stream of consciousness uh, lyrics and uh, and I've you know kind of expanded upon them and ended up with the current version but there must be about six seven different versions uh, there was even a swamp swamp pop version of it at, uh, that low stairmasters one of my uh, recording projects with oh, Anthony yeah. Estrada did yeah I remember that and he did yeah. the vocals he was you know, and it, we're trying to sound like uh, Louisiana swamp pop. You know, like uh, uh, lazy, never, lazy, Lester, lazy Lester, lazy <laughs> Lester, Slim Harpo. Oh, and, okay, all um, right, all right. You know, kind of along the lines of that. So it, it's had, it's gone through so many permutations, and, and people are saying it shouldn't have even been done once. <laughs> Hey, I wasn't one of those people. I just find that interesting that song goes that far back. Speaking of your writing style and all that, you have quite a wit to your lyrics. Quite a, some people might even say a dry wit. What what do you think influenced that? I mean, were you around funny people when you grew up or people calling you funny? Well, were you a stand-up comedian as I, a child? What? I was around mirrors. <laughs> you know, seriously, um, Going back to influences that I haven't mentioned yet, Nick Lowe, his, uh, when I heard his album, I probably heard it like about 1980, Pure Pop for Now People, Jesus of Cool over in the UK. You know, he had he had some uh, songs like, uh, <laughs> with lyrics, <laughs> like, she was a winner who became the doggy's dinner, she never meant that much to me, and, you know, so... The, and the music was just like really melodic with and extremely well played because it's rock pile. It was right, like probably right. one of the best hard driving oh, traditional rock bands that absolutely you know from that era or any era for that matter. An outstanding lineup too. And, Dave you know, Edmonds. Dave Edmonds and the unsung hero I think is Billy Bremner. He can yeah, play yeah. like ringing a bell. And Jerry Williams on drums later on was with uh, Dire Straits, but but you know you know hearing you know uh, the first couple of Nick Lowe albums and then hearing the first Marshall Crenshaw album, it's like wow. And I think one of the early recordings that I did on that four track, another one probably even earlier than that, all stretching time, was a cover of Cynical Girl by Marshall Crenshaw. Right, you, and that was you probably did that? from 19, on that? 1983. Yeah, that was definitely around that and time. I think I also did uh, a version of what I like about you the r- romantics well, that's, you know, a couple uh, you know, of Detroit that's interesting talents. yeah because I I don't recall ever hearing you do much as far as covers I mean when I played with you of course we did two and they were both very you know uh, off the off the radar straight to hell from driving and crying Mm-hmm. And even though they were a big band, the Guns N' Roses used to love her, but it wasn't, you know, a big, big song. Other than that, you did, you were doing all originals. You stuck to your guns. But then again, but getting back to it, other than like music artists like that that influence your writing style and all that. At, growing up, were there any like comedians that you, because you mentioned Monty Python, that oh, yeah. helped develop your sense of humor yes. that would then later on stem into your music Yeah, style? I would say Monty Python probably warped my brain warped a considerable. Lot of <laughs> and George Carlin. Carlin, yeah. Uh, I remember uh, one of the earliest albums I bought was a uh, cutout of uh, takeoffs and put ons, which was recorded at the Rooster Tail in Detroit. Oh, and wow. that I think that was recorded in like 1967 when Ooh, Carlin was still pretty oh, much a traditional stand up uh, stand up comedian. Sure, and, 
but he had you know some of the true you know uh, some of his classic routines like the Indian Sergeant. Right. There'll be a rain dance tonight, weather permitting, and you know the top forty. Uh, radio, wonderful wino. Yeah, I know that's classic. I can see because I can see a, a, a lot of that in that because your humor is not only just kind of dry, but it's very topical. Whether people get it or not, that's another thing. Because as you know, as an artist, there's so many people out there that just don't seem to understand anything that isn't jammed down their throat by the industry. And you know, oh, yeah. and, and they and your stuff, even though it's it, it, it's tongue in sheet, it always has an underlying meaning to it that if you really listen to it, you're gonna understand what you know what it's about. Yep, and I I really don't use a lot of metaphor. You know, I usually will just I'll use aphorisms rather than metaphors. And explain that. An aphor aphorism would be you know kind of like a turn of phrase okay. that people might remember. You know, might be uh, comical, it might be uh, uh, witty. Uh, it might you know the attempt to expose a certain truth in a uh, roundabout manner. No matter where you go. Oh, there you are. Pretty much. <laughs> Play a sport. Go ahead. Don was always coming up with these great lines and stuff. But when you said metaphors, uh, there's a song that comes to mind and stuff. And, uh, and I wasn't going to mention it, but I can't help myself because it's, to me it's, it's too classic not to. Uh, te if telephones were diamonds, um, that's not met metaphorically? Well, yeah, that one I think I kind of found a metaphor and ran with it or stumbled. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Well, like but, we were talking earlier, well, I think that would have been a beautifully perfect country song, especially at the time it was in And that's, that's what influenced me, you know, like uh, country songs with titles like, uh, you know, like uh, early Elvis, uh, You're Right, I'm Left, She's Gone. Right, yes. And uh, I Forgot to Remember to Forget Her. <laughs> and, you know, something like that, only I wanted to have something that would ultimately make people go, what the? And maybe <laughs> maybe cringe a little bit. I cringe a little bit. <laughs> but it's got it's got one of my one of my better melodies to it. It and, does. It really does. It's and beautiful. people be you know listening, tapping their foot, maybe yeah. humming along. And all of a sudden, the telephones were diamonds. I'd give you a ring. I said, I can't believe you said that. What? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Well, Jeez. no one else had ever said it. That was it. And and, and I thought it was absolutely Maybe there was a good reason that they did. <laughs> no, I, 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 I just think that's, that was part of your musical, lyrical genius stuff. Because, yeah, it's kind of corny, but it, it's definitely, it, it's meaningful well, at the same time as to uh, uh, superstantial materialistic things that, you know, uh, I don't want to get on the women and all that, but, you know, would want the stuff out of a man, a young, handsome man like yourself. So that's kind of how I interpreted well, it as far as and that. Whenever I, whenever I performed it, you know, it was like I was definitely putting my heart, heart on, the, on my yeah. sleeve. Yeah. And, you know, that was part of putting, you know, the joke over. Yes. And, and uh, when I, I think I'll probably record it again on an upcoming uh, I hope album. So. I'd like but to be on I, it, though. I'm, I'm, I'm changing the title to just Ring because the full title gives up way too much of the song. Okay. So All I think right. I'm just going to call it Ring, and then if people coming to it firsthand will, will go, okay, this is nice. Oh, yeah, nice I melody. I can hum along. What? Come on. <laughs> Okay, talking a little bit more about your uh, your musical dynasty, which it, it is to me because you've come such a far distance. It, it, you've evolved so much, you know, from a you know an ape to a man. But no, musically, um, you had a song called "Surfing to Jamaica" that was released on an indie album. Tell us a little about that, and how that came about. How All right, I I had heard that uh, Bongo Boy Records, an uh, indie label out in New Jersey, uh, they were soliciting submissions for surf instrumentals for a compilation album they were going to release in August of 2016. So I uh, I had good version of Surfing to Jamaica where I did all the instruments on it except the drums which I uh, put together from loops and samples and so I go okay I'm gonna submit it and they 
probably aren't going to like it and I'll get like a re, you know standard reply email and I'll just print that out and put it on the wall maybe frame it right <laughs> and and you know that's what I was expecting and they said hey we love it you know like here's what you got to do uh, we need a mastered wave file and I go well, I, I, I do my own mastering I can right. do that no problem and send it to them and uh, it was the 14th of the 15 songs on there and they pretty much put the album together in chronological order when they received the submissions. Now, how did you know it, that? They tell well, you that's, that? that's what the, uh, the, the label had uh, told me. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Monique uh, Grimmie. Right. And uh, so it was released, uh, I believe, August 9th 2016. And what was the and, record called? What's the album called? Uh, it was. Uh, I thought it was like gnarly record. N- gnarly, gnarly wave volume one. And I think there were like eventually three volumes. Was it all surf that music? What's that? Was it all surf music? Yeah, it was all surf, uh, uh, surf instrumental. And we, uh, you know, and the owner and the uh, the, the chief A uh, and R uh, person were members of the uh, academy that you know puts on the Grammys. So they submitted that, and it was accepted in the first ballot for the Grammys, wow. the, like the 59th Grammy. Like uh, the the show aired, I think, in February of 2017, and in the category of uh, best contemporary instrumental and to give you an idea of you know the other artists who are up for that in the same category like Herbie Hancock yeah and uh, Snarky Puppy wow and you know a few others I mean heavy hitters and yeah, yeah. it's just like well there's no way we're gonna win but you know for one month we were you know under consideration well, you yeah, know members of the academy you know members great. of the academy were listening to it so and you know we didn't make the uh, cut but hey it was it was great the first time i submitted to a label it gets accepted and then it gets uh, a first ballot for the Grammy. It's just like, okay, have you just, when's have you... my when's my TV miniseries yeah. gonna show up? You know, but uh, but you know, a year less than a year later, I was uh, sitting in a car listening to uh, Little Steven's under underground uh, garage and the Bill Kelly police? program. Was that That's... a police car? Shh. <laughs> I, I'd rather not say. My my attorney says I should not speak about that. Okay. But. Uh, <laughs> but getting back to uh, the story, I was listening. All of a sudden, I hear "Surfing to Jamaica." And wow! I go, and I go, "No way! That's something that I I unconsciously ripped off. That can't be me." And I turned it up, and it's just like, "Oh, that does sound like me." And it was uh, bumper music, you know. It was played for like about five, six seconds, full volume, then it was you know, cut down in volume. And the uh, announcer, Bill Kelly, you know, did his back sell of the set. And in the background, you can hear Surfing to Jamaica. Speaking of and, which. And, and I kept listening to it. I turned it up, and I heard the guitar solo. I go, okay, no one else is going to play a solo like that. So that's me. <laughs> and that had to be a total thrill. Oh, I, mean, I was First song I, you submit, gets on a record. Gets nominated for Grammy and then it's played on the radio, well, even if it's in a short part. So what? It Not didn't get nominated, but it was like in well, the, the running. Was. So it was like maybe 30 other uh, artists were vying. Uh, yeah, but don't sell yourself short. You were part of that project, yeah. and they considered you. You know, good if it to wasn't it. up to snuff, it never would have gotten yes. that far. So exactly, I, I take you, that as a matter of pride. Have you <laughs> considered, or maybe you've done this already, submitting any of your other material because the your last, your latest album, the Forever Endeavor. I mean, that's top-notch stuff. The production is great on it. The songs are great. Had you ever thought of maybe submitting a song or two off of that to a label? <clears throat> I've been I've been thinking about it. Um, my next album, when I finally get around to recording it, another ten I, I think time. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to uh, you know try to uh, maybe send a, a song or two. I think. I might send a single to uh, that label I was on before, yes. uh, Bongo Boy, yes. and you know, because they have you know good connections, and I had a good experience uh, with them. But uh, my upcoming album, I've got a bunch of older songs that, for some reason, I just, just slipped through the cracks, and I. I'm going to be rehabilitating them, and I'm, I'm thinking, wow, these are good songs. Why did I, they are good why did I forget about them? So, uh, 
the next recording project will be the uh, the vacuum dwellers. Now, and it might be just myself, mean? and maybe one or a couple other uh, musicians. And that's I came up with that idea because it seems a lot of the time that you're creating in a vacuum, and you put out stuff that you think, wow, I think this is good. I think it should appeal to at least a hundred people. And you know, so I just go. But you know, so just the idea that it's just like I, you know, I really feel like I'm creating in a vacuum. So let's go with that. And it's kind of tongue in cheek. Sure, sure. Like and all in, your stuff. And in the uh, the title of the album, I think is like one of the best titles I've come up with. And it goes back to one of my primary influences, Nick Lowe, his first album. It's, his album was Pure Pop for Now People. So my next album is going to be called Pure Pop for No People. <laughs> And who are these people? Uh, well, that, I, I'm just <laughs> anticipating, you know, like uh, not a whole lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm about it because, let's face it, most people really don't like music. They're, they're not into listening to music and, and discovering new artists. No, they're, right. they're into celebrity worship. Yes, yes. And most people won't listen to music unless it's high to Right, them. big time. And, you know, how many times have you gone into, like, a used CD store and find all the ones, all the CDs that were the big hype bands from, like, the 90s, and you see 10 copies of Cracked Rear View by, uh, right. you know, Hootie and the Blowfish and stuff, you know, and they're not, not bagging on them, but, you know, hype is how, you know, how the world works. Well, that, uh, it, it, I don't even know if there really is a record industry anymore because everything no. goes straight to streaming, Spotify, uh, you know, Amazon Music, iTunes and all that. And th this generation, like you say, because there's so much media, I mean, you got everybody walks around with a cell phone, you know, you got all this TikTok crap and all this, everything's a different craze. So unless... It's, like you said, really promoted big time. It, it, it doesn't even get noticed. And then yeah. it's not normally sold on a, a CD or a vanilla method anyway. You know, yeah, you see music going in the next 10 years either. Basically, you have legacy artists that'll yes. be on labels. You know, you got, you know, like Bob Dylan, uh, Paul McCartney, you know. Springsteen, those guys. Yeah, big you know, yeah. And you too, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to be, if not selling physical copies, they're going to be big on Spotify and all the other Deezer yeah, and, well, and all that. Yeah, they keep repackaging all these artists. And, and, yeah. and the Rolling Stones, you yeah. know, they're going to be out there making mega bucks on the, uh, on the big mega tours. Yeah. And I, you know, I think you've probably seen some of these uh, artificial intelligence uh, generated song videos. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, that might be where music's going. It, it's like they'll just sample legacy artists and have the backing, you know, uh, generated from a computer, and that's all you're getting. And, you know, it's kind of impressive when you hear that, but it's lacking that magic, for lack of a better term. That's what that's what turns us all on to music, you know? Yeah. Like, when you got into music, it's like you heard something that just floored you. Yes. Yeah. And, you you know, you got, like, goosebumps. Yes. Yeah. Same thing. You know, um, I think one of the songs that did that for me was when I first heard... Uh, Night Moves by Bob Seger, and uh, when I was coming in to visit here today, that was the last song that was playing in my, uh, wow. in my car, and I thumb drive. Great, great storytelling song. Yeah, and, and great dynamics, mm -hmm. and you know, like that song, you know, was just very well wrought, and you know, very well played, it was just, I think it's an uh, all-time classic. Oh, absolutely. And when I first heard that, you know, I got, you know, the goosebumps, and I just go, wow, that, that's something else. That's something that I want to, and I think uh, probably wasn't long after that that I uh, went out and got the uh, album. Right. And, you know, but I, I don't know. Uh, there's going to be, there's going to be a strong, vibrant underground because, you know, continuing, because there is right now, there's great music coming out. You just got to dig for it. Absolutely. You know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of my friends on uh, Facebook are musicians who, you know, put out, put out records on a regular basis, sometimes only on their band camp, sometimes. Sure. There are some really good labels, like uh, Big Stir Records out in uh, Burbank, California, has a lot of great power pop artists. Um, 
right here locally in uh, uh, Michigan. Um, they have uh, Sub Jangle and Future Man Records. That's more uh, power pop. Um, Little Steven uh, Van Zant has a label. You well, know. you mentioned power pop. This song we're listening to, This Small Town, I would consider this, consider this power pop. I mean, it, 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 this is a great song. It's a storytelling kind of song. It kind of reminds me, it always kind of reminds me of something that, that I could have seen John Cougar Mellencamp cover because yeah, of the whole yeah. small town and not just because of the reference to the same song oh, as yeah, far as that but the that's kind of where I was coming from uh, that was written in 1983 one of my earliest songs and probably the oldest song that I have other than uh, Owl Stretching Time that I uh, still re you know recorded and you know I think it was probably probably from like uh, listening to the Uh Huh album like yes. Pink Houses and yes. you know some of that stuff with uh, Great stuff. with John Cougar uh, Mellencamp who is you know even though he was mega I think is still underrated as a uh, as a songwriter and performer he had well he had he had, a, he had a big day in the sun and he kind of like disappeared a little bit. One of the other artists I know you didn't mention, you went back when you mentioned like Nick Lowe, uh, that I always kind of thought of as far as you, as far as not anger, but angst a little bit in some of your lyrics and stuff. Elvis Costello, were you a big fan oh, yeah. of Elvis? Yeah, definitely. I uh, remember when, I think, I think the first song I heard from him was Accidents Will Happen. Yeah. A lot of radio play like uh, oh, yeah. March, April, of 79 and uh, I am a big fan of like the first three or four or five uh, Costello Absolutely albums. Absolutely um, A lot of the British artists from that era really uh, strike deep even now. Uh, a lot of times if I'm, oh, I don't know what to listen to, Armed Forces I'll throw on yeah, or yeah. you know like uh, maybe Basher by Nick Lowe or Dave Edmonds you know so Did you like ever... Dave Edmonds, Nick Lowe, Elvis Costello, Graham Parker and the Rumor. Yeah yeah that's the Records uh, was a great power pop band, and Joe Jackson. Yeah, oh, I love Joe Jackson. Did yeah. you ever get to the album Spike from Elvis Costello? That had some real dark uh, stuff on there too. Really kind of. Uh, yeah, I you know I think I had it, but I didn't uh, I didn't like that as much as his earlier stuff. Like right about the albums before that, like King of America yes, yeah. and Blood and Chocolate yeah. are like the last two that really hit deep with me. And there's like there's been a few, and, and you know Spike had you know Veronica, yeah, which I thought exactly. was a, that was a collaboration with uh, uh, Paul McCartney, and I thought that was song. a great pop rock yeah, song. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, you know that just didn't stick with me the way his earlier stuff. I mean, his first ten years. So you think it might have been too no, not really or? that, just that. I mean, hooking up with McCartney, I mean, I don't know. Just, you know, just I think he was, he was, uh, you know, branching out, and I think I might have missed the urgency that was in his earlier stuff, but I think from 77 to about 87, he put out a body of work that is just uh, incredible. All right, speaking of a body of work, we're all waiting for your box set, by the way. Uh, <laughs> there's a story that comes to mind, and I know you'll know this story and stuff we talked about a little bit before. We're living at the Fort Play Mansion, or I think we retitled it when you and Brian were living there, something up the Granville Estate or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, few of the members from television, Billy Ficka, and I can't remember the other people. Oh, Actually, yeah. they were called something else. Stayed there overnight, <laughs> and tell us a little bit about that adventure that took place. All right, it's um, a classic. Well, Brian Brian T knew uh, Dave Rave. They go back a long time. They're pretty good friends. And Dave Rave had his band in the uh, early '90s called the Dave Rave Conspiracy. It had Billy Ficka on drums and. Er, before that, Ficka was in The Waitresses, who had oh, a hit yeah, with yeah. I Know What Boys Like yes, and, and yes. Christmas Rapping. Yes. And, uh, now, that, that, and was then, that after television then? That was after okay, television. Okay. And uh, then Lauren Agnelli was the bass player. She was in The Washington Squares before that and Nervous Rex, which was a uh, like New York area uh, new wave band. Right. And so they were in town to play at the Bookies uh, reunion. This was like, was this like March of 1992, I think. Yeah, I know it was early. And 90s. and so we're we're just saying, hey, you know, don't spend any money on a, a motel room or that. 
we, we got room here at the estate, you can stay here. And so they stayed there for a couple of days. And Billy uh, was sleeping on the couch in the <laughs> living room. room. And I had a cat named Hepcat, and he was still a kitten then. Yeah. And uh, he uh, he was playful and was attacking uh, poor Billy's uh, feet. <laughs> and you'd hear him, damn it, get that cat out of here. <laughs> Stuff like that. So, so that was... And I, and I kind of regret not, you know, I had a chance to hang out and talk with him a little bit. Yeah. I kind of regret talking to him more about his drumming because back then I was all about guitars, you know, tunnel vision about it. And since right. then I've realized that the rhythm section is probably more important than the guitars. Because you can have okay guitars. If you have a stellar rhythm section, yeah. you're, you're going to have a great band. Right. If you have an okay rhythm section of stellar guitars, well, it, you're not going to get the locomotion you need Correct. to really get that rock action going. That's right. So I, I kind of regret not being able to, you know, talk to him about some of his influences, you know, because I, I believe he had some jazz influences and, you know, like the whole band television, you know, I think they were trying to do a rock version of what John Coltrane oh, yeah. was doing. Yeah. From okay. like the mid '60s, yeah, and I see that. you know, with uh, Tom Verlaine, may he rest in peace, yeah. uh, doing his uh, modal uh, guitar uh, uh, scales, and you know, that was not very many people were doing that at that time. I think Richard Thompson from Fairport Convention was, was probably doing it, you know, doing it, you know, as early as anybody. Uh, some of some of uh, Paul Butterfield uh, uh, blues band with uh, Mike Bloomfield had some modal, and I think uh, both uh, Bloomfield and uh, Elvin Bishop doing some of the modal guitar trade-offs, like on uh, East West on that album and Work Song. But yeah, that was the television is a uh, that first album, Marky Moon and Adventure is a great, yeah, just in, in, just incredible. It's, it's it's of its time and apart from its time. It's like you know. It's it's definitely a classic. There's nothing else that sounded like that. And they were the one of the first, if not the first, band to play at CBGBs. Isn't that correct? They were the very first. Yes. In like like summer of 1974, and then the uh, Ramones came in not after not long after that. Yeah. Blondie and a whole bunch of others. Yeah. You see, that's a uh, that was a venue that owned. If you ever could have gotten up to New York and played that. They would have got you. I really think maybe not in '79, because you would have been pretty young. But I'm just saying that club was for a long, for so long time, and, and a lot yeah. of great artists came out of that from so many different. I mean, it seemed to start out kind of like a punk new wave underground club, but they had some great artists. The Police played there, you know, and some other people, Talking Heads, and it was always stuff coming in from different directions. And I don't recall this. This is just me not recalling how many artists that would have played there that were even close to your kind of style, as far as lyrically and ambitious. Oh, as there's. You would. I don't know. There's there's quite a few uh, came in there. I would say um, I'm not sure if the Smithereens were. A, I don't. They were more of a Maxwell's band. Yeah, but they were more power pop than more than a, a more power pop than I think some of your stuff was. Yeah, and it but, wasn't, and some of it was witty like yours, but not as much. Yours, I, I, yeah, I, they, to this I, day, I, I, I wish I could as write as well as uh, as uh, Pat Venezio. Oh, uh, yeah, don't put yourself He's down. Terrific. You're He's a great writer. Awesome. You were a great writer. But uh, but the, uh, you know, I think the closest that the Detroit area had to like a CBGB's was uh, Bookies. Bookies, yeah. And unfortunately, that was a club that I never got a chance to go to. Yeah, me either. I heard a lot of stories about and it. And I think, you yeah. know, like in the in the 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, it opened, reopened, and I just didn't get around to going yeah. there. Yeah. You know, like it seemed like I went to reruns until it closed in November of 80. Uh, Paychecks, yeah. Hamtramck Pub, and Lilies. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, those those four were the ones. Every once in a while, you go to the Ritz, right, in Roseville and uh, St. Andrews Hall. But they St. were like Andrews. the they were like mostly for the national international groups. Oh yeah. Sometimes yeah. you'd have like a local group that was going you know uh, going big guns you know like like Rhythm Core. Mm -hmm. And uh, spent yeah, center yeah. stage in uh, in Canton. Well, Canton, yeah. I went to the, went to see a couple of shows there. Yeah, we picked that. That was a wonderful place to play. Yeah. Up to me.
Wonderful. Um, God, you made me lose track of what I was going to say. Um, who are some? Who are the musicians that are that are playing on the Forever Endeavor? And who are the musicians, other the same musicians that that were on the Humble uh, Serpent album? Same, just two of us. Uh, myself playing uh, rhythm, rhythm guitar, lead vocals, some background vocals, most of the bass and uh, keyboards, and then Anthony Estrada was played. Uh, the lead guitar. He wasn't solo. in Chips, was he? No, oh, that was Eric. <laughs> yeah, his but, brother. Uh, <laughs> but he uh, he played bass on uh, indie rock superstar. Great song, great song. And that that was kind of a, a satire on the uh, uh, whole indie rock scene. And I got the idea for that. I saw probably I don't know like 2005, 2006, 2007, somewhere around there. I saw a commercial and it had like an indie rock band playing in the background as the music for it. Right. And, it was just loud, raunchy, and the vocals were kind of flat, and it was just like, geez, I could do better than that. <laughs> I guess better give me, than give that. me $100,000, and I'll, <laughs> I'll give you the soundtrack, all right? Yeah. But I, then I thought, okay, I'm going to write the song, and I think I wrote it in like about 15 or 20 minutes. And, you know, it's this went gold in Canada. It sold 500 units there because, you know, the standing joke in Canada, you don't need nearly as many sales to get right. gold status as you yes. do in the U.S. Oh, no. And then, uh, you know, certified cardboard in the States. I've got no market share. I'm an indie rock superstar. You want some fries with that? <laughs> I love Got that. to where I am today, playing loud and singing flat, and then, uh, <laughs> and then I think the the most telling line I think is like toward the end where I go, my girlfriend slept with Billy, Eddie, Evan, and Bart. She really didn't mean to. She couldn't tell us apart. <laughs> and it's just like we have. Well, the room was. We so all kind of have dark. a tendency to wear uniforms. Yes. To just show yeah, yeah. that okay, I stand with this group rather yeah. than that group. And you know, I did that. You know, I dressed up new wave. I had the the jeans and a, a leather jacket or a sports coat with a, a horizontal striped shirt. You know, sort of like the Ramones and skinny ties. Yes. You know, it was like that was a great time though. Was even in the mid '80s, I was dressed in 1978, so I was kind of behind the curve, but I thought it looked cool. <laughs> you know, but you know, but in you know the metal kids dress metal, and you know, and you you knew where they uh, stood. You know, now I dress like a slob, and people think I'm homeless. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I shaved off my beard and just like, you know, I'd be standing around. Well, I have to around. say, Don, I think you look a lot younger without the beard. Oh, thank you. I'd be standing <laughs> around with like an empty coffee cup and people passing by, I throw quarters in <laughs> and I just go, come on, I'm not homeless. Jeez. Okay, Don, <laughs> let's get right down to it. You said you're going to be recording another album. Hopefully it won't take 10 years. Where do you see yourself maybe a couple of years down the line as far as your music? I, I think, because one of the things I think you've done before but didn't elaborate too much on was keyboards. Are you going to think of maybe putting some more keyboard sound, weird effects, space rock? I mean, space rock, folk, well, I have, anything to that I have a recording center. project that I've uh, had for a while. I've got like about eight or nine different recording projects on Reverb Nation. One of them was like a crop rock, space rock tribute called the uh, Germanic Depressants. And, you know, just instrumental. Uh, Where did you come up with these names? I just, you know, <laughs> they're not in the cracker check box, I know. <laughs> but, you know, was, I, I was trying to, uh, uh, I was trying to, Kind of channel noi craft early craft work uh tangerine dream you know oh, some yeah. of the uh, uh can some of the uh, classic kraut rock bands of the late 60s to mid 70s and uh had came nowhere near but it's like it's that's ah, close enough you know <laughs> close yeah, enough for put it out I, but I only did like three songs but um you know i'm gonna you know try to have more a little bit more keyboards just to add some textures um more acoustic uh, I recently bought an electric 12 string. I want to have some of that 12 string jangle. I want to get more of a like a power power pop um, sound. I want to have more harmonies. There, there's some harmonies on, on you know like the Forever Endeavor yeah. and scaled down, but they're they're kind of subtle and you know not a lot of counter counter melodies in yes. that. So I'm gonna get more involved with that. Uh, you know, I've been working on my falsetto for maybe doing some falsetto. Uh, have you harmonies. 
be a thought of using like auto tune at all. No, no. I mean the T auto tune. <laughs> well, the other thing, Don, I, 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 and I think this would be kind of cool because if anybody could pull it off, it would be you. Did you ever think of maybe forming an all? Because you mentioned this earlier, an all kazoo band. One of those milk jugs, you know, for the bass and all that. All <laughs> instrumental, classic country stuff. No. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Is that, that too far out there for you, Don? Just a little bit. <laughs> I was. I, was I don't thinking, mean as an insult. I think I was thinking of uh, having a remember Mr. Mr. Haney from Green Acres. Yes, yes. I was wanting to do like a Mr. Haney's uh, karaoke happy hour <laughs> album, and a bunch of songs sung in the voice of Pat Buttram, also known as Mr. Haney. Yes, yes. Mr. Douglas, wild thing, you make my heart sing. You make everything. Groovy. Yeah, you know, I think that, that would go over to, really good. I think nah. it would. I, I, <laughs> no, I, I, I like that idea, you know, because there again, it's comical, it's tongue in cheek, it, it's brilliant all the way. Um, I'm just glad, Don, that you're still alive and kicking and you're still recording. Yeah, me look, too. Look, looking forward <laughs> to anything you do in the future. Uh, as as we know, we're trying to get this band reunion thing together where we want to have you on the bill. Hopefully that will come up come about this summer sometime. Cool. Look forward to playing with you on that. Always love playing your stuff. Uh, it was too bad, like I said, we couldn't find Skippy and get him involved. Oh, in yeah, yeah. But, you know... Uh, we can work that out, you know, I'm sure. But, you know, if we can get Ray Kazora on board, Oh, yeah. yeah. He's, he's another uh, uh, another guy who's uh, always been, you know, very supportive yes. of, of our different bands and our music. And uh, first time I went into, like, a real professional studio was at Ray Kazora's. Yes. And we did uh, did a song, uh, Walking with an Angel, and uh, had uh, Mark Simich on guitar. He was, really, he was a really good guitar player. Yeah. I and, that version uh, is great. And that was like the first song of mine that got airplay. I think on uh, w, uh, WDTR, the Detroit music scene, Scott Campbell had that uh, program. And then I think at WORB, Orchard Ridge uh, Radio, college uh, station. I've had, I've had music played on college stations, satellite, internet, uh, radio stations. There's like three hosts that have played my music, uh, Jim Prell. And the Music Authority, yeah, I Mike Lidskin, right, and uh, he's on uh, Woody Radio, and also Boris Bowden has the Secret Weapon on uh, uh, Woody Radio. And uh, every so often, I'll tune in and say, "Hey, they're playing me, cool." Yeah, I walk a couple feet off the air for a little bit. And, yes, but it's you know it's cool just getting uh, you know getting Any getting kind some of airplay sure. and getting some recognition. Sure. It's just like I never thought I would you know get that, and all of a sudden it's just like I've had eighteen songs of mine played on various formats. That's so, awesome, and you deserve it, because they're great songs. Not making any money off it, yeah. but I never well, got into it for one. money. Yeah, a lot of, get, a lot of artists that don't I get never many. quit my day job, yes. because real musicians don't quit their day job, you know. It's so difficult to get people to listen to something they haven't heard before, and if you can get somebody who can give you a fair hearing, it's like, man, those people are MVPs in my book. All right, last question, Don. Uh, you mentioned some of your influences earlier and all that. We talked about Costello and Lowe and all that. Who were some of your favorite local bands that were playing maybe alongside or around the same time? At, well, you know, with reruns, paychecks, those Yeah, I would have to say your band, uh, Foreplay. I mean, I've always enjoyed you guys playing. It was always fun. You know, we, we, we all had the same aesthetic. Let's, let's not take ourselves too right. seriously. Let's go out there, rock and roll, and have a blast. Right. Noise Boys were yes. on the same uh, same line. They were uh, they were killer we, band. You know, the Junk Monkeys, we used to, uh, they were probably like the, the biggest band on the local scene at that time. Well, they were the and, Mystery Girls first, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. The Mystery yeah. Girls, and then the Junk Monkeys, yeah. and then uh, oh, Orange Ruffies. Yeah, yeah. Remember them? And uh, trying there's, to think, oh, there's oh, just remember so the Happy Accidents? Oh yeah, Paul, Paul, Einhaus. Paul Einhaus yes. and uh, uh, yes. Jim, the drummer, is a Facebook friend, and uh, yeah, they that goes back to like '87, something like that. So it's like like a, it was, those were good times. Oh, great times, Don! I remember all the fun we had living together with Brian and all that. The the one of the funny. Uh, 
of the wackiest stories. I knew, and obviously you knew, kind of connections that Brian had at the time. But oh, yeah. I remember that one day we're all home, and he gets a phone call, and I happen to answer the phone, and he, he asked for Brian. I said, "Yeah, he's here. Who can I say is calling?" And it's, and I, I my, I'm doing a mind blank here. Uh, guitar player singer from the Violet Femmes, Gordon Gano. Gordon Gano, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no. And I said, <laughs> it's yeah. like, hey, what are you guys doing tonight? You know, you want to go see him? And Meadowbrook with the B52s, and I just like, no, that wasn't him. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, somebody's pulling yeah, a leg. That was great. Yeah, and we went there. Uh, the B50, you know, we, we saw the Violet Femmes. And then we uh, went backstage and yes. we're hanging out with uh, Gordon for yes. a while. He's just really cool guy. Yeah, just down and, to earth. And then uh, seeing the B-52s from yes. the side of the stage, it's yeah. like, how often do you get that? Oh, you I know. know. And, and then going back to their, ho their yeah. hotel where afterwards and getting to hear Gordon, I remember this, play an unreleased song that he was coming out with. I think it was something, I think, if I'm not, correct, not mistaken, was something he was going to do kind of as a duet with, uh, oh, darn it, what's her name from The Pretenders? I, oh, Chrissy Hine. Chrissy Hine. I wow. thought I remember him saying that. I don't know if that ever came to, came to wow. fruition. Yeah, I can't stuff. remember. I'll have, to, I'll have to Google it. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. But there again, there were so many good times, so many great memories. Another one of my great memories, and I tell my wife this all the time, was your cooking. Especially, especially your spaghetti. You know, I tend to make spaghetti. I know this is off talk. And you would chop up, you'd spend hours chopping up vegetables, black olives, onions, carrots, everything. Set, everything you could do, you could put in there that was totally untraditional, but it was awesome. The secret was a lot of people, a lot of people will, will cook the meat, they throw the vegetables in, they cook it all in together, and the meat will dominate. Yes. the vegetables. So what I did was I would cook, saute the vegetables separately, cook the meat separately, and then when everything was ready, the meat was brown, the vegetables were fully cooked, dump that in, and throw in the ragu or whatever yeah, sauce, yeah, yeah. and mix it all up together, and then throw it over the pasta, and it's like, call it good. And it was, and it was good. See, I, I brought that up because I can see another, uh, another phase in your life where you're gonna be this famous chef coming up with these homegrown things that, you know, people are just going to be blown away <laughs> by good, bad, or otherwise and stuff. Anyway, I'm going to close this out. Is there anything else you'd like to mention that I didn't bring up? Like, like oh, for example, I'm going to have, where can they get your recordings? Oh, yes. Um, on Bandcamp, Nolan Void. Go, go on to Bandcamp and then search for Nolan Void. That's with the E on the end of Void. N-O-L-A-N-V-O-I-D-E. That silent E on the end. Right. And uh, the Humble Serpents are there, and uh, the Nolan Void uh, albums and well, couple they, of collected they both singles. On Spotify also. I'm on Spotify, um, YouTube, uh, Amazon Music, and Deezer, and a, and a couple other ones. Uh, with my uh, label, uh, it was a year ago signed to a uh, British uh, indie label called uh, uh, Shambotic Recordings, um. and they put they. Reissued the uh, the uh, Nolan Void uh, Forever Endeavor album. I did a remix of it, and they put that out. And also the hum they put the Humble Serpents out first, and then they did the uh, Nolan Void album, and uh, they put it out on uh, various uh, streaming services. Yeah. And uh, I hope. In addition to the uh, you know the vocal album, uh, I want to have an all instrumental album by the uh, Beatles of Free Jazz yeah, I'm side not project. Yeah, I've mentioning that before. And yeah. that the title of that is Broken Rubber Soul. <laughs> and I was hoping that people would want to check it out just because of the title. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's and uh, I've got the basic sued. tracks of that. Some of the songs, like two or three songs, are finished with uh, with uh, Anthony Estrada on a lead guitar. And I'd like to get uh, uh, Eric Lockhart to play guitar and keyboards and. Uh, 
on the upcoming album, you're going to be playing the bass and, bass, cause and harmonies because, uh, you know, we, uh, we had a practice session back in November just like, yeah, this is the guy I want to play bass for. <laughs> well, so. I, I appreciate the compliment. I know you can do better, but I'll take the compliment. Anyway, uh, we'll close this out by saying this is Jimmy Jive and this has been Motor City Rock Talk. My, my guest today has been the legendary Don Johns, a.k.a. Nolan Void. Look his stuff on Bandcamp, Spotify, Amazon Music, just like you mentioned. You won't be disappointed. Anyway, keep rocking. <laughs>